Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hi. Hey. How you doing? I'm good. I was thinking about a key distinction the other day that was kind of confusing me. Maybe. Like a key, like a... No, like a, like a critical distinction oh, or critical. an interesting distinction. Somebody was talking to me, I don't know, one of the internet things that they talked to me like... Instagram or something. They sent me a message. Instagram was talking to you? Somebody on through. Oh, someone on Instagram. Some was person was using yes. some technology to send me a note. I can't remember if it was Instagram or Facebook or I don't remember. But they were asking me the difference between like grit, resilience, and like anti fragility. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that's an interesting distinction. Yes. And it's interesting that that. It was a real life example of how in order to understand one thing, we have to understand the things it's not. It's a good point. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm starting to see that a lot. People are sending me questions like, what's the difference between this and that? Right? Yeah. And so I was thinking about grit versus resilience versus anti-fragility. Yes. And it seems like the difference. I just speak in my love language. I am? I love grit. You do? Yeah. And these other terms, yes. So I was trying to, I wanted to answer this question. They're all very similar, but slightly yeah. different. But I, I took it to heart that somebody was asking me for an answer. And so mm -hmm. I sort of thought about it and did my own sort of is, is not list of three things mm -hmm. too, which yeah. is possible. Yeah. And I kind of came up with this and I want to hear what you think about it because I don't know that okay. I'm right. Is Grit is the ability to push through something, to keep going yeah. through adversary, adversity. And then I was, in contrast, resilience is the ability to go through something and cope or heal or be okay, like after you've had an event that has been a struggle or a difficulty. Mm -hmm. I get a little off the off the rails with anti-fragility because it's a new term in, yeah. in some ways. And to me... I was thinking about anti-fragility was more about using adversity and struggle as a strength rather than a weakness, <clears throat> becoming less susceptible to negative effects of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Though. I mean, I'm sort of spitballing it now, but I don't know. What do you think about all that? Because I was, I was really taking it seriously. Like, what is the difference? Well, I, I think... In the in the literature, the big the big difference is well. First of all, anti fragility is kind of a new thing. It's yeah. um, it's a new word yeah. that's describing a lot of old, well known phenomena. Right. Um, and uh, but generally speaking, I would say anti fragility is talking about the feedback and the improvement right so you're it it's it has this notion of improvement whereas grit just has like this idea that you you can persevere right yeah. but not that you're improving oh, per se I you're see. just persevering yeah i think that's a kind of a um it's kind of a straw man of grit because obviously uh, you know when I mean, I, because I was a guide and because I yeah. worked for Outward Bound for so long and still do, um, you know, grit is a huge part of what we do and resilience and anti what's called anti-fragility now. Inside of Outward Bound, you mean it's something you, you it's, try to develop? It's you part and parcel of what Outward Bound was about, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the story of of Outward Bound's founding was a guy named Kurt Hahn, uh -huh. Um and he was a German-born Jew who left uh, Germany. And um, the way that I, the, I sort of turned this into a story for folks to understand. So, you know, uh, they, the, um, in the North Sea the, during the war, the Nazi U-boats were sinking all of the supply boats. Mm -hmm. And the supply boats weren't w warships, but they were bringing supplies Right. back and forth right so they were pretty critical so War, yeah 
the Nazi boats were sink, sinking the, uh, the the U-boats were sinking the the supply ships, and when they did, the, the supply ship would blow up, and there would be all these guys in the water. And oh. this is in the North Sea, very right. difficult conditions, very difficult, very yeah. cold, right? Yeah. And then these, the ones that lived, which were very few, but the ones that were remained alive, you know, were holding on to pieces of wood and anything that would float. And basically a, a group of them would be holding on for dear life, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe four, five, six guys, yeah. something like that, holding on to a piece of floating material. Right. And then they would somehow try to, with the currents and with their own effort, try to get back to... A, a not Nazi occupied yeah. territory like Place, England yeah. or yeah. you know Wales or uh, yeah. uh, Ireland or Scotland or wh wherever, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what what they noticed was quite surprising. Like what? What did they notice? Well, so at the time, the. Guys that were on these ships, the guys that were part in the old days, it wasn't just young guys fighting in the war. It was like everybody, yeah. right? So, so that you had you know fifteen year old kids, mm -hmm. all the way to 60, 70 year olds, all in the same boat. Yeah. Right. Well, what they were finding was in the process of these guys getting back to the mainland, a, a number of them would slough off and and drown and die and things like that. It was pretty pretty. Gruesome. Epic, yeah. gruesome conditions. And so the, uh, Kurt Hahn was kind of a sociologist, and he was asked to study why it was the case that the young guys were dying in a greater proportion mm. than the old guys. Wow. Now, why is that, right? Well, you you think, yeah, you'd expect, you'd expect the, opposite. The, the opposite to happen. Right. These old guys, you know, they're yeah. not as in good shape, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the young guys are all these yeah. strapping young men. And why is it that the young guys are dying? That doesn't make any sense. Interesting. So they asked Kurt Hahn to sort of study the issue, and and he did. And he was an educator and, uh, you know, d different things. And, and he basically came to the conclusion that these Older guys mm -hmm. had all these mental models built from the uh, things that had happened in their life. You mean previously? Previously. Right. Right. So they made it through the potato blight. They made it through uh, the death of a mm -hmm. child or the death of their wife or the, you know, the death of their parents or the death of their brother. Or, you know, some kind of event that was difficult right. in their life. And so as they're clinging on to this, they're saying to themselves, well, you know, I made it through that. I can make it through this. I see. You know, and they also understood the importance of teamwork and taking care of each other and, right. um, you know, compassion and all the, all these kinds of things. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it was the old guys that were making it back. Because they had, they had the, the sort of mental toughness to know, yes. um, to know that they could do it. So right. a lot of it was sort of their mental in yeah. their mind. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Not, not just not their bodies because the their bodies part. weren't, you know, quite as yeah. physically capable in many ways. So the Duke of Edinburgh wanted to start a, an organization th that Kurt Hahn was the founder of mm -hmm. um, to do what at the time they called the moral equivalent of war, meaning they wanted to get these guys trained up really quick because they, they needed to put them on boats and they needed to get shipping to here and there and everywhere. Mm -hmm. So they wanted a training that they could train these guys up really quick. I see. And give them these life experiences, essentially, but like I see. right quick. Without waiting 20, 30, Without, 40 years right. of experience they didn't have to do 20, it. 30 years to wait. What well, you're saying, in other words, give the mental toughness into the physically tough. Yes. The yeah. younger, more yeah. physically tough. And that was Outward Bound. Outward Bound means is the name that's given to a ship when it's leaving harbor. Ships and safe. Ships in harbor are safe, but that's not what ships are built for. So. <laughs> um, Outward bound, and there's a, a blue Peter flag, which is the flag that they they that a ship sails. It's a blue flag with a white square in it. That's yeah. the symbol of outward bound. The, literally, the term outward bound, we think of it as the, the organization name, but outward yeah. bound means that the ship is heading out. Heading out, 
it's outward bound, hmm. right? And um, so the outward bound was started for the express purpose of essentially creating grit. Well, and resilience. And resilience like and anti-fragility. That's interesting. I mean, those terms. Uh, before those were terms. Before yeah. those were terms, right? Or before they were widely known. Well, resilience was one of the original principles of, of Outward Bound. Yeah. And it seems to me they're all related. Yes. Right? Of like you obviously yeah. need grit to become resilient. Sure. And then you need sure. the resilience to actually build that anti fragility. A, lo a lot of it's just mar modern marketing, right? But Modern marketing. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's, it is one of the most important and overlooked things today. Mm -hmm. And I think it is um, it's unfortunate that I think kids kids don't have as many opportunities to build grit and to have access to grit building activities yeah. or anti fragility building activities as they maybe used to. Right. Um, and I think I think they know they young people know that they need this. Right, which is why they. Why they seek out challenge and, yes. they, and they want to push themselves. I think it's probably why a lot of kids become both athletes and good students because it's a way that they're challenging themselves to have sort of the grit to be able to do many things at once well, not just one thing, yep. right? I mean, if you think about outward bound, if you said what you said was outward bound, the whole point was to, um, for lack of a better word, like simulate those kinds of experiences that would build grit, but mm -hmm. purposefully. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that so that younger men at the time, I'm assuming it was men. Yeah, it was all men at the time. Younger men would build the skills of grit and resiliency and all of that. Well, I guess that makes me wonder. So, what do we need to do outside of outward bound, like maybe in schools? Right. Isn't there a lot of talk about like building these skills for younger kids, age appropriate? younger kids like to try to get kids to well so, certainly uh there's not enough talk about it for sure it needs it's it's declining i think in its use why how so i i think we've lost touch with how important it is i, I think we've lost touch it's not it's not really in the curriculum right um it's it's not you know there used to be a time in in america where you know many many kids Many kids yeah. would just assume sort of a, an hour bound experience of some type, yes. some kind of uh, coming of age experience, right? Some right, what's called a rites of passage experience, yes. right? And yes. when there are m numerous rites of passage in life, but one of them is around that threshold of, of puberty and then another one later on, you know. Um, yeah. How many how many kids really are yeah. doing that today? Well, it seems to me like that rite of passage needs to be in flavor. Trying to do something that you can't, you don't think you can do, yes. and then actually doing it to build that confidence, to build that experience. That's right. This might not be very popular, but like the whole idea, like everybody gets a trophy for participating in something, <laughs> right? Well, yeah. that doesn't that that's great in one sense because it's inclusive and it rewards all participation but that to me seems the opposite of building grit yeah because you don't have to push yourself to to do better to work harder to to compete right mm -hmm. like competition actually in a weird way has gotten a bad name now yes because it, it feels i guess to some people exclusive competition yeah i mean like what's the impetus to get better if you're not if you're just if you show up and you get a trophy anyway yeah. Like you're not pushing yourself or, you know, things like that. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, certainly more traditional forms of competition are, um, I don't know how to say it really, you know, people are more against them than, than they've been in the past. Yeah. At the same time, I think there's, it's not like we've gone away from competition. We're just competing in different domains, right? So we're competing to see who can, who can be the most different we, we're competing to see who can be the most uh, affected. You know, some some of our students talk about, uh, you know, the oppression Olympics and the trauma Olympics. And, you know, so competition is really something that we all do. We mm -hmm. just do it. Naturally. It doesn't take much to be good at those things. 
Right. Right. So like, yeah, we see this on social media a lot. Everybody's competing for more eyes on more this, yes. more that. And and so what does it take? It takes just doing crazier and crazier stuff. Who, mm-hmm. Who's ever willing to do cra- the crazier or the most random stuff. or the, you know, the most ridiculous yeah. um, things is going to compete outcompete those who are not willing to do yeah. such ridiculous or say yeah. such ridiculous things. Um, and so there's there's competition. It's just it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of skill. Yeah, I mean, I think involved that involved in the competition. But I think part of that is an uh, and you know, I could go on forever, but I think that's kind of a downside of what started with reality TV. Right? <laughs> right. So reality TV was like we're just going to sit around in a house. Yeah. And see who who becomes the most controversial and therefore then the most popular. Right. And then can start their own social media and then they have their own YouTube. And then it's like they become a celebrity. Just for just for the, the sake, sake of, of becoming a celebrity. Yeah. But they don't actually have They're not good at anything. a skill. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, I won't name the few that bother me, but yes. people who know me know who they are. Yes. But I think they have had a, a very negative effect. The Kardashians on on the I didn't say it on the youth on the youth on the youth on the youth. I mean, you think kids all the time. Like you ask them what they want to be. Like I want to be a vlogger. Yeah. You know, I want to be somebody who literally just. Did they say vlogger? Is it vlogger? Vlogger. Like a vlogger. A blogger. No, a vlogger, a video blogger, like somebody who sits in and says their opinion about a a video as you're watching it. Yeah, yeah. That's That's, nope. What is a vlogger? Oh, well, so then there's the vloggers and there's the commentators. The commentators, yeah. I don't know what their names are, what you call them, but the people that literally the one our comment kids like is on Cody Co. Yeah, they comment on a video yeah. as a video. Like yeah. they make a video of them yeah. commenting on a video. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you could be, you could, you could stretch it and say they're good at marketing themselves and self promotion. And, and also you could say they're good at sort of sound bites. Yeah, I mean, they're doing so. That's what I mean by competition. They are doing something that obviously lots of people want to achieve and they're not able to achieve it. So the question is, you know, like they must be doing something that is, yeah. you know, has some skill involved or whatever. Maybe we just don't see it. Yeah, but I also think we've shied away from, I think we've shied away writ large, sort of societally and educate, like, our institutions reflect our so, our new social norms, yes. and we have a new norm or, or, that sort of moved away from pushing people to strive, to compete, yeah. to better themselves. See, you, you know? think it's you think it started with the reality TV, but the, I think reality TV actually started with um, with Survivor. Oh, really? I think that was a yeah. Uh, Is that the first Mark, reality TV? Um, uh, Burnett. Yeah. Started, I think that's his name. He, yeah, it is he, name. yeah, he started Survivor, and that, and you know, when Survivor first started, it was it was pretty real. Like it was hard. Now it's like way not as hard. No, you know, they, they have more they've food, eased it up. and they've yeah. cut it in half in terms of days, yeah. and they're constantly they're finding like, ways to give them food, ways to give them food and, rewards. Yeah, you know, so uh, just the grit. The if we're measuring grit or resilience or anti fragility on the on the survivor scale, it's gone down for sure. Yeah. And um, but the social game has gone through the roof, right? I mean, like if you're a strong, yeah, physically strong player, you're not going to make it to the end. Because if you keep winning the comp, the physical they'll competitions, vote, yeah. they'll turn they'll and vote, vote you out. Yeah. So that means by the end, the person who has won. Is not always the strong, the sort of you know, what do you call it? like the triple threat? Yeah, social, yeah, physical. Not. What's the third one? Outlast, outlast, outwit, outwit. outwit. Yeah, Outplay. that's interesting because I think that is like an indicator species of every, like everything. Yeah, if you think about, it. like think about when we were kids, we had to do the pre- presidential fitness stuff. Yeah, and you had to literally struggle to do push-ups in front of every person in, in your grade, yeah. and fail miserably publicly, and literally be told in front of everybody you failed. 
Not that I'm reliving a childhood memory. <laughs> it seems like you're reliving. <laughs> but like I could not do not push ups, pull ups. <laughs> pull ups, yeah. Right. So for girls, pull ups are a little harder. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. And and you think now if somebody did that now they're not harder. You're just not enculturated into them. Well, girls we'll can do pull ups. We can do pull ups, yeah. But we're That's not. Right. You're not. You're not expected to do. When I was younger, when little, we were not so, encouraged to develop right, pull up like exactly. skills. Exactly. But you have the absolute ability. But we do. were tested on them. I mean, some of the best rock climbers in the world. Yeah, yeah, now. But think about when we yeah, were. Yeah, no, I'm saying it's not enculturated. Like, I was discouraged. From math. From, from math, science. From, science from, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, I'm, so. I'm saying it's not girls' fault. I'm just saying, um, what was I saying? Oh, so I'm saying if we did that today. Yeah. If a school district did that, where they actually ran the presidential fitness test. And the kids had to perform in front of all the other kids. And they verbally out loud passed or failed them in front of all of the kids. That school would be in hot water. Yeah, probably. Because it is, it would be not seen as healthy competition building grit and resilience. <clears throat> It'd be seen as a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I think, I think I, what I was going to say is I think th that might have been reality TV, but it, I, it very well could have been positive psychology. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. I'm not against positive psychology any more than I'm against negative psychology, per se. Right. I just think they're both biased. I yeah. think we should do reality therapy uh, if we're like going to do, you know, anything. And um, and so reality therapy is that you don't have to put good and bad on everything. It just is. It just is the way it is. And, you know, I like, like that. you know. But I think we got, I think positive psychology was a wave that taught parents and taught educators that you have to always be positive. And, and I just, I think that's not healthy. I think it's people healthy, need to no. hear, you know, real feedback from the real world. You're doing well, you're, you know, you're not doing well, you're comparing well, I, to. I like the way that. We were we started talking in sort of pros and grows. Yeah. Like here's where you have you know strengths and here are places where you could develop. Yeah. Right. And it's not really positive or negative. It's like here's the reality. Yeah. Here's 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 reality of where you're at. Yeah. And that actually puts the agency on the person. In some ways. I think that's a, pros and grows are a good one. That's what we use at Outward Bound. Yeah. Things like that. Um, I always loved uh, Jim. Uh, uh, the trustee of Cornell there, Jim. Uh, oh, Morgan. Morgan. Uh, he he has a great book and and saying that um, you know, what is it bad? Bad news is good news. Mm -hmm. Good news is no news, mm -hmm. and no news is bad news. Right. And I think that's that's yeah. pretty accurate. Yeah, meaning you're going to only learn from... Not only, but, but like, you know, finding out all the things you're doing well isn't going to have... I mean, it's going to have an effect, sure. You, you can continue to do the things that you're doing well. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that we shouldn't give positive reinforcement about good things. But, you know, bad news is good news. Like, getting yeah. feedback, like, hey, this didn't go so well, got it. Up yeah. your game on that. Because you can improve. You can improve that. You can grow. Yeah. And then no news is the worst kind of news. Yeah. That's the part that, uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot of folks need to hear. No news is bad news. Why? Because you, then that means... If nobody's giving you... Feel, I, I used to have a football coach. He used to say, Cabrera, I wouldn't yell at you if, it, <laughs> if I didn't like you. You mean if you didn't have potential to change? Right. Like yeah. You didn't waste the time. Yeah. Like if you're not getting any feedback from people, that's bad. That's a bad. That's time. bad. If if your product is not getting feedback, if if nobody's saying anything, if uh, that's not good, right. that you should take that as not good. And that's you should bad look for feedback. feedback. Yeah. Yes. And you should look for feedback. <laughs> you should so look for you feedback. Purposefully look for it. Yeah. I mean, that's why they started doing like three sixties and stuff. Yeah. Right. So I could check my self perception against everybody else's. That's like yeah. a whole new way of feedback, right? Because then you you don't realize you don't realize where where there's a mismatch between what you think your strengths are and weaknesses, and then what other people think. Yeah. So I don't know. So how do we fix it? Develop grit. Develop anti fragility. Develop you know resilience. Um, 
And I think there's really a formula for doing that. It's pretty simple. You, you know, I think you, you, uh, you know, challenge is change. Yes. Right? You're not going to change in any way if you don't challenge yourself. Mm-hmm. So you've got you, you to gotta challenge yourself. Yep. T- and you got to get better every day. That's why our that's our kind of it's a great motto. Yeah, great. Better every day. So you're constantly improving. You see it as an incremental thing, not a not a I'm gonna, you know, make it all at once. That's a big mistake people make is I'm gonna I'm gonna be great. You know, right now I'm terrible at it, but by tomorrow I'm gonna be perfect. Yes. Right. And the reason that's not good is because it's not reality based. It's not reality. Yeah. So you know you're gonna get better every day. A little bit. Make progress. A little tiny bit of progress over a lot of days, and you're going to see improvement. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly getting out of your comfort zone, Mm -hmm. challenging yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You got to get out of your comfort zone. For sure. That's what a challenge is. Yeah. And that'll lead to growth and change. You want to do it every day. You want to do it on a systemic level, what I call Vitruvian. Say more. Well, what you're inevitably going to realize when you try to do any kind of improvement is that it's everything's kind of interconnected, right? Everything's kind of at a, your, your, you and your life are an ecology, right? So if you try to work on your physical, you're going to realize, oh, I got to up my mental game too. I if see. you try to work on your mental game, you, you're going to realize, boy, I, my mental game's a lot sharper if my physical game's going well. So you're saying, you're saying, don't just focus on one area do all all things like yeah, mental vitruvian social like everything emotional else. you know yeah vitruvian is you know at least at the very least your your mental your emotional your social mm-hmm. your physical and your motivational you know those are the big ones yeah but then there's little ones underneath like if you're if you're lifting weights you're going to realize you better start stretching and yeah. the more you stretch you gotta lift and you know and and you want to be doing plyometrics, you know. You want to you want to you want to balance it out. You always want to be yeah. systemic, even inside of the one, even yeah. inside of each one of those. You're going to find out, you know, that that over reliance on any one thing is gonna is gonna kind of imbalance you, right? right? And and here's the most important part: uh-huh. Re- reflection, metacognition. Okay. So the the thing that people don't understand, and and this is super important, Outward Bound made this mistake for a long time, and then, and has, and Outward Bound was really very instrumental in in developing what we today is called experiential education, and is used in, you know, K-12 schools all over the country, all over the world. But Outward Bound kind of was the, one of the one of the founding, yeah, you know, the pioneers. forces, pioneers, I yeah. would say, maybe not founding, but pioneers of, of experiential education. And there's a huge mistake that people make is that the experience, I mean, just think of the word, the experiential mm-hmm. education, they think the experience is the thing. Yes. The challenge, the experience. Yes. It's, you, we don't we don't learn from experience. That's counterintuitive. People are gonna it's gonna people are gonna be like, oh, yeah. he's crazy. What do you mean we don't learn from experience? Yeah, we don't. We don't learn from experience per se. And and if you want to test that out, just look at the number of people who have the same experiences over and over again and never learn the lesson. Right. Right. And they get in these patterns. Yeah. Yeah. You, we see them all the time. Yeah. We learn from reflecting on experience. We learn when we're metacognitive about experience, when we're aware of, of what's going on with that experience. So we learn when we challenge ourselves to get outside of our comfort zone in a systemic Vitruvian way. Right. And then we reflect on that. We, we're metacognitive about that. So th- that's the equation. Challenge yeah. yourself out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Get better every day. Do it every day. Mm-hmm. Do things every day that get you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Right. Challenges change. Do it in a systemic way, Vitruvian. Yeah, meaning across all facets. And yeah, across as many facets as, as you know you decide you need mm-hmm. to do the thing that you're trying to do. And um, metacognition, reflection on on the challenge. Right, and I think a way to sort of um, tie that back to what you were saying earlier is if you think about learning from experience, mm-hmm. outward bound, you go and you experience 
some some challenge or something in nature. You climb a mountain, you cross a river, mm -hmm. whatever it is. And that is the experience. Mm -hmm. But the way you, you sort of are developing the grit and the resilience is the self-reflection on what you were able to do totally. from that experience. Yeah. Right? So, so that's exactly why you're saying the reflection is the key piece to it's huge to the change yeah because i i mean part of the reason why today i'm so you know my whole career and everything's focused on mental models yeah. my research um is because for so many years i saw we would go climb a mountain mm -hmm. and then we'd come back and talk about it and everybody had a different version of what happened everybody had some people didn't even think about it Really? Yeah. They just, they were done and they were moving on to the next thing. Without even thinking about it. Didn't even think about it. Didn't huh. think about the experience, didn't take anything away from the experience, didn't... They just literally thought they climbed a mountain and that was it. Yeah, it was like a dog. <laughs> Went up the mountain and came back down the mountain and that, well, that was, was it. Fun. That was fun. You know, yeah. that's interesting too. Yeah. But, but I'm saying everybody had a different experience. Mm -hmm. And so... When you process that, when you kind of get a little bit metacognitive about, oh, okay, well, what did it mean to you? What did it mean to you? Oh, then, then you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. That's interesting. It was about teamwork. I didn't even, yeah, I didn't even think about serving my fellow team members on the way up. I was mostly worried about myself and how you know yeah. big of a headache I had or whatever. Right. You realize how important those those mental models that are built because the next week the climb isn't going to be with that person one week from that climb. Right. What's going to be with that person is the mental model they took away. Right, which is why the guys in the water yeah. did, did fared better Bingo. because they had prior mental models that they learned, you know, prior, prior experiences. experiences that they learned from by yes. reflecting, yes. realizing their skill sets, their resili the That's ability right. to, to be um, resilient and know with confidence that they could get through this thing because it's it's a different challenge on its face, but it's the same skill set that they need to that's get right. through it, right? And that's really important is like a week from today, if we climb a mountain on a Tuesday, the next Tuesday, you're not gonna have the climb with you. The climb is in the past, yep. but what's in the present mm -hmm. is the mental model you built about the climb. Right. That's what you're gonna have with you a week from then and two weeks and five weeks and five years. So the reflection, the mental model that you take away, whatever that is, we have to try to develop better. So we want to have young people engage in these experiences that are challenging yep. on multiple dimensions, on Vitruvian dimensions. Yep. By Vitruvian, I just mean the Vitruvian I man. That, mean, that, uh, yeah. Across all Leonardo domains. Did. Yeah. Yeah. And so... You know, we want them to have those experiences, process those experiences, metacognitively reflect on them, and then take those away with them. Well, it seems to me then the role of educators or experiential, um, ex you know, experiential leaders like mm -hmm. Outward Bound instructors, summer camp coaches, is to purposely build in that reflection as an exercise, because we don't always do it naturally. I mean, we should we should try to do it naturally, but in the absence, like say you had third graders. Yes. Well, they're not going to necessarily no. reflect. No, most people aren't. They just think they just did something fun. That's so, absolutely yeah. right. So what we want to do is actually not only build in the desire and the wanderlust for experience, mm -hmm. but also the 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 familiarity with processing that experience. Yes. And making meaning out of the experience, right? Mm -hmm. So. And, and in that sense, we don't want people to just go and and have an experience and then be done. We want people to have challenges mm -hmm. in their regular everyday lives to think of their day as a as a format for challenge. Yes. And even to think of little micro challenges, little micro wins that you can yeah. have along. The, you know, this is why ice plunge is so great because it's like a micro challenge. It's it like is. nobody wants to do that every day. Every day, I look at that. And go, <laughs> no. You know, what? Your body's like, nah. You know, yeah. I don't want to do that. Like, but you why do it, would and then you? you're like, I feel great. And, you know. Yeah, and you get that little get tiny that little... reward that you did something you didn't think you could do or didn't want to do. Yeah. You did it. You succeeded, and you get that little, little reinforcement bit. that you can do things that are hard or that you don't want to do. Yep. 
And that builds that sort of resilience, that grit, the grit to push through, the resilience, you know, after the fall. And the anti-fragility of, of the yeah. sort of long-term betterment of, yeah. of getting better every day. So if we, if we make challenge equals change better every day, yeah. that's the first principle. Second principle is that I think is critically important is a systemic principle of the Vitruvian doing that at a Vitruvian yes. level. Mm-hmm. Right, because some people do it on one track. Yeah, and I think that can get you myopic. Yeah, right. And then the third thing is build in the the metacognitive ability to make meaning of this challenge experience mm-hmm. and the and the systemic change that you're bringing about. Yeah, that'll build. That'll get. Them. That'll build grit. That'll yeah. build resilience. That'll build. And frankly, that's what our schools should be. That's th- this shouldn't be a program that we go through. This shouldn't right. be like a, a you know a a thing that schools do. This should be the thing that schools do. Well, yeah, and I all would, day long. And I would say not just schools, but it should be something that we as a society embrace as a process 100%. that all humans should be going through. So parents, educators social norms absolutely all of that should be absolutely. focused on that and then we would be better off for it and there's great programs out there but they're declining in popularity which is sad to see you yeah know? yeah but the, you know whether it be our bound or Knowles or or the Co- conservation corps mm-hmm. movement uh, is a fantastic movement or you know any any really any kind of challenge of any kind in any in any systemic you know, ecological Vitruvian way mm-hmm. that has a reflective metacognitive component, yeah. right? That's bringing that meaning to the experience. You but know. you're in control of that as a person. You're in control of of being metacognitive or not. Sometimes it's hard. Imagine, imagine for example, that I just took kids like teenagers mm-hmm. and I just jumped them out of planes all day long. Right. Yeah. And then we repelled off of cliffs all day long. And then we, you know, we just like crank the dopamine all day long. We're just we're just mm-hmm. doing extreme stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And then we go home and then we come back the next day and I jump them out of 10 planes and I repel them off of 10 cliffs. And I, yeah. you know, do 10 cliff dives and then we, you know, maybe do wingsuit and, yeah. you know, let's just see. Mm-hmm. How then we maybe go do some roller coasters and, you know, challenge. Not necessarily change. Well, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to create a person who who gets addicted to the dopamine. Yeah, the rush. And then just constantly has to outdo the, the thing and yeah. just is looking for more and more and more and more and more of that. Mm-hmm. That's not really what we're talking about. No. Right, so you, I, that's an extreme. I'm I'm showing you that extreme of what could be done. Mm-hmm. That is not what I'm talking about. Yeah, that that I has these it. three components. In other words, you're doing those things, you know, uh, the cliff dive, the rappelling, to sort of in the micro teach mm-hmm. them you can do something that's hard. You have the yeah. mental and physical strength to do it. You stood at the edge of a cliff. Yeah. You have a fear of heights. You faced it. You faced that fear. You overcame the fear. You 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 were rational about the fear. You trusted your person. You trusted your equipment. You checked your equipment. Yep. You double checked it. You were careful. You took a calculated risk, mm-hmm. and you stepped off that cliff. Yep. And you were able to enjoy it on the way down. You were able to stop your belay device and look around, mm-hmm. and it was okay. Something that you thought was not going to be okay. Right. And then you, you know, that that's the process. Yeah. That you take them through. Yeah. Um, which is different than repel off this cliff, get the dopamine rush, and totally and, different. And like we're on to the next thing, and we're yeah. on to the next thing, totally. and we're on to the next thing. Yeah. Because you want them to take away, I faced something that was hard or that I was afraid of. I thought it through. I did it. What does that mean the next time I face something that I'm afraid of? What other things am I afraid of that I could think more about Yes. that maybe I don't need to be afraid of? Or what things should I be afraid of, right? Like Mm -hmm. like being afraid of heights is a very natural uh, and, and evolutionarily protective thing, right? So 
you know, we, we want to know what are actual risks, what are perceived risks, how do, how do I interact with those real yes. versus perceived risks, yeah. and um, how do I navigate those? And once you can navigate those, you can navigate anything, really. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So grit, resilience, anti-fragility, they're all related. Yeah. Um, and they all come down to what you were talking about, like challenging yourself to change reflecting on the experience to take away what you're trying to build in terms and of better every day yeah, yeah, yeah doing it uh, yeah. doing it seeing that as not like a once in a lifetime thing yeah. seeing that as a way of living a lifelong yeah thing. a lifelong thing where you're constantly evolving interesting well i think that's a wrap that's a wrap i think it's a wrap wow. i think i think actually we've answered the question good what are they what's the difference why do you know how and why and i think that's what we just set out to do, maybe. Nice. What do you think? Here, let's do a... We did it. Mm-hmm.